Hi, I'm Jenny Champeau. I'm the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and we're so thrilled to be joined today by Jasmine Rapley. Thank you for being here. Excited to be here. This is fun. So Jasmine is the director of communications at Scripture Central, uh, where she oversees the marketing efforts of the organization and also creates content for the Scripture Plus social media accounts. Um, I highly recommend checking those out. Hopefully you already are using those um, in your study and teaching, but um, so many great resources over there. Uh, Jasmine has a degree from Brigham Young University in Ancient Near Eastern Studies, and she has a passion for sharing the gospel online. Um, we're so grateful for all you're doing, and thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Of course, this is going to be fun. Today, we're looking at the scripture block in Helaman, uh, chapters 7 through 12, and the artwork is by Lilia Vargas Mendez. Um, she's titled it Nefi, Hijo de Helaman, Derama su alma, Adios en la Torre. So in English, we might say um, Nephi, the son of Helaman, uh, pours out his soul to God on the tower. And this actually won an honorable mention in the 2019 Book of Mormon Central Art Contest. Um, and again, if you go to Scripture Central, you can see all the wonderful art that they've collected through their art contests over the years and, um, and just from other sources, too. Um, and this, this artist, I believe, is from Mexico. Is that right, Jasmine? Yeah, from Veracruz. Can you tell us any more um, before we get into the artwork? Do you know any more about um, Lilia Vargas Mendez? I'm afraid I do not have any more information beyond that. So she submitted this to the 2019 contest and we give a section for the author or the artist to, you know, give a little bio if they want, but she was pretty short, pretty succinct and just gave us the title and, you know, said that this was a piece made on an oil painting on canvas and that was about it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, so let's look at the artwork then. Um, tell us what do we see here? What's going on? And how does this relate to Helam in chapter seven? All right, so this painting, as I mentioned, is an oil on canvas. And this is an artist from Veracruz, Mexico. And it's depicting Nephi on his tower in his garden before the um, highway leading to the chief market. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from Helam in chapter seven. This is Nephi being uh, disappointed and pretty dismayed about his success with missionary work up to this point. So at this point in the narrative, he is going up to this tower to pour out his soul to God, as the title of the painting suggests, to um, pray to God about the wickedness of the people. Um, but it's half a prayer to God, half a speech to the people, and half a display of dramatic prophetic speech towards the people to help them understand the direness of their situation. And so uh, in this painting, we've got a wooden trust tower with the thatched roof, Nephi on top of it, and then he's surrounded by very verdant vegetation between you've got palm trees and flowers and a little waterfall. Um, and then it, off in the distance, you can see um, the the road heading towards a market area there. Mm -hmm. And so this moment in particular is depicting Nephi before the people arrive. So this would be like the very beginning of chapter seven. In Helaman chapter seven, uh, he starts praying to God in the first beginning verses of Helaman chapter seven. But then in verse 11, it talks about how that there were certain men passing by as he saw Nephi pouring out his soul into God. And then they ran and told other people and they collected a multitude. So this is kind of an interesting moment right before the big action. And the culmination of this whole narrative is Nephi predicting the murder of the chief judge um, or declaring the murder of the chief judge before anyone knew about it. He prophesied it and then they send messengers. And sure enough, wow, the chief judge was slain upon his judgment seat. And so this is kind of a, a moment right before the big action of the scene and the narrative. It kind of reminds me um, in, in that way, like uh, Michelangelo's David, where it's like right before he's about to kill Goliath is the scene being captured. And so this is like the same sense of anticipation, tension. Nephi knows what he's trying to do. Not only is he praying to God? And it's not that he's praying to God and people just happened to show up. I think there's 
the sense there that Nephi knew people would be there. Mm -hmm. He is deliberately doing this as a way to deliver a message. So this is him like right before he's about to do this big prophetic display and doing it in a moment of introspection, connecting mm -hmm. with God right mm -hmm. before. So it's a kind of cool moment of anticipatory tension, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I've wondered that too. Like what why is he up? Why is he shouting out this prayer on top of a tower? And yeah, I think you have to assume maybe he was hoping to to draw some attention that he was kind of at at his wit's end of what to do with these people and his dismay at the Gadian and robbers and the way they've taken over the government and are oppressing the poor and oppressing the faithful. Um do we, now I know you you have studied a lot about ancient cultures. Um, is is this kind of a garden tower something that we see in ancient America or any other ancient cultures? I mean, maybe it's hard to say for sure because so much of I mean, what we see here is like a wooden thatched structure, and something like that is very unlikely to survive the material culture of ancient <laughs> yeah. America when it's hundreds of years. So what we only, the only stuff we have of ancient America are stone structures. And then anything that we have in carvings, iconography, or the very, very rare codices that we still have mm -hmm. um, that weren't destroyed. So we have very, very limited knowledge of like what architecture would be like and anything that's super perishable. So mm -hmm. it is possible something like this exists. We there are, There is some evidence in ancient Mesoamerica for a wooden structure like this um, in uh, one of the codices talking about coronation for kingship. And that's mm -hmm. something that as Scripture Central will sometimes use to contextualize King Benjamin's tower. But mm -hmm. What probably is a little bit more likely is maybe some sort of low stone pyramidal structure. There is some limited attestation of uh, like low pyramid-like structures that are small, not the big like Chichen and Itza, like pretty uh -huh. small stone pyramids um, that would be as part of a housing complex. And we've also uh, seen them at like uh, Tikal. They have some limited examples of this in Palenque. Um, but in addition, there's attestation of some of the other features Nephi talks about in this story, such as a garden area being in close proximity to the housing complex or being directly adjacent to a main highway that would lead to a chief market. So we know that mm -hmm. highways are attested in ancient Mesoamerica, that they had pretty robust, complex systems of roads and highways leading between settlements. Mm -hmm. And then the markets were really vibrant and robust as well. They had a system of having um main markets and a network that would then distribute to the smaller markets um to get the goods distributed among a given population so mm -hmm. we have kind of all the check boxes of what nephi is describing here and i think part of that sets the stage a little bit for um why nephi might be doing this in the first place like i mentioned there's a couple hints that he kind of deliberately was hoping for a crowd yeah because he's right next to the highway and it's right heading towards the chief market. There's a good chance people yeah. were going to be there. It is the main thoroughfare. Yeah. And there's that, the, the, just the geographic setup here that he's on a tower, he's next to the main road and he knew people were going to show up. But then there's also kind of some precedent in the old Testament. You have a tradition sometimes of prophets doing symbolic dramatic displays of um, like performative speeches if you will like uh jeremiah like renting his clothes to represent mm -hmm. you know the people um their destruction and jeremiah had like a few different symbolic acts that he would do as prophet and so there's at least some scholars have suggested maybe nephi is doing something of that nature to really like get the people to pay attention and in this case at least john w welch seems to think that um, what's happening here is kind of a mock funeral speech because uh, Nephi keeps talking about, um, you know, the destruction of the people, the decay of moral values in Nephite society. And then it really culminates in uh, verse 17, where after he lists like all the mournings and the lamentation he has over the iniquities of the people in verse 17, it says, uh, wh why will ye die? Yeah. <laughs> and so it kind of culminates in like this death pronouncement. And then a chapter later, he finally pronounces that the chief judge has died. 
And so I think he's playing a lot on funeral imagery, or at least diction within his own speech. And that's reflected a little bit in the imagery here, uh, even if the people aren't there for this dramatic display. But I think because there's precedent in Jeremiah for doing like kind of dramatic, performative, prophetic demonstrations for people. And because he's Nephi is setting himself up in a publicly seen place. Right. I think Nephi was doing this deliberately. He knew what he was doing. He wanted to be there in front of the people to see if he could convince them to repent. Mm. So, um, and so having like that low stone pyramid structure next to the highway that led to the chief market would have been a perfect uh, setting in which to do this. So that's all of that to say, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on <laughs> in this section. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I was struck too that you mentioned King Benjamin because I mean, that's sort of our iconic idea in the Book of Mormon of a prophet on a tower, right? Is King Benjamin up on his tower. And this and this comes later. And in fact, um, just two chapters earlier in Helaman 5, um, Nephi's father, Helaman, um, tells, tells him and his brother Lehi to remember the testimony of Benjamin and his testimony of the atonement and of Jesus Christ. And, um, and then, and then right after that, we have Nephi being so distraught and going up on this tower. Um, and, and I think it's an interesting visual link that, that maybe he's doing on purpose to link himself with prophets like King Benjamin. And in his speech, he talks about Moses and Abraham and, and, and then the, there are the people that come, there's this whole debate about, is he really a prophet? And that's part of why he gives this sign of the, you know, the sort of prediction of the murder of the chief judge. And, and then people say, oh, he must be a prophet if he, how else could he know something like that? Um, unless he did it, which is another thing they say. And then they, <laughs> then they bind him and question him. That's a fantastic insight with the trying to, a visual connection to King Benjamin I hadn't thought of before. Uh, but I definitely think he's trying to connect himself to previous prophets. Like you said, he connects to Abraham and uh, previous prophets. But then he also directly calls out Nephi and Lehi when he says, you know, oh, if I could have been in the days of when my father Nephi first came out of the land of Jerusalem, yeah. then I could have joyed with him in the promised land. And then would my soul have been happy. But alas... <laughs> I am consigned that these are my days and my soul shall be filled with sorrow because of the wickedness of my brother. And that's in verse nine. So there's definitely a, uh, a nostalgia for the earlier days. I don't know if the first Nephi would have agreed with him that he right. had it easier, but I think right. that's human nature as well. We all tend to think like, oh man, if I could just go back to then. It would have been so much nicer. For sure. But. That's the perpetual um, wish of every generation probably. Yeah. Um, so I noticed looking through the Book of Mormon art catalog, there aren't very many images of this moment of Nephi on the tower. Um, I think we have cataloged 11, um, but only this is, comes from only four artists. So several of the artists have depicted the scene multiple times or Jerry Thompson, who did the 1978 um, Book of Mormon stories uh, illustrations. He, he did quite a few different angles of this moment. It, it does. I do see some compositional similarities to the Jerry Thompson piece from the 70s um, in terms of this tower on the left and then this winding road back to the, the Zarahemla and the market and the, the mountains behind it. Um, but I like that that um, Lilia Vargas has um, shown this moment before the people. So in Jerry Thompson's image, there are already people in the road and starting to pay attention. But here, like like you pointed out, this is that moment of anticipation where it's just Nephi pouring out his soul here to God um, right before everything unfolds after that. So I think that's nice that she's done that. Um, and I also just as an art historian, I have to I notice things like flowers. <laughs> flowers have so much symbolism in art history. Um, and I don't know if that's what the artist intended here, but I noticed these beautiful white calla lilies um, right there up front in the. Um, at the lower part of the picture. And um, calla lilies are often used in religious art, um, in Western religious art, to represent purity and faithfulness. Um, and, uh, and and also sometimes they're used at Easter to, to represent um, ideas about resurrection and, uh, um, and calling our minds back to Christ and this idea of, of rebirth and atonement through Christ. Um, That's kind of what I first thought about yeah. when I was looking at the lilies, this, the motif of resurrection or potentially even funeral, at least in my mind, I associate oh. lilies with funerals a lot. 
And so like, yeah. in my mind, that was maybe a nod to this contrast. I mean, this scene mm -hmm. on the surface just feels to me so peaceful and so serene and so calm because it's verdant. There's running water, there's beautiful lush flowers, there's this peaceful tower and a very still looking city in the background. So it feels just so peaceful, but with this undertone of like, this is right before Nephi is about to throw down the hammer on their wickedness, announce a murder and himself kind of do a performative funeral, if you will, a prophetic mm -hmm. performative funeral. And so it's just yeah. like this little undertone of, of, of foreshadowing death of some sort, even though it, it appears so peaceful. That's really interesting. Do you, or do you have any other like final thoughts on your personal reaction to um, these scriptures or this artwork? I mean, like I said, it just, I, I love this because it feels very calming to me. I look at it and just like the beautiful flowers and the water flowing and it's very, I don't know, like if the composition of the garden area feels almost womb-like to me in the way it's just like enveloping and warming and comforting, um, looking off into the distance of the city. And it's, it's, it just reminds me of like Nephi's reprieve, like he's come back home, he's come to his uh, home turf and his base to reconnect with God and reestablish himself, but then to also clearly accomplish a mission. So it's like, I don't know. I just feel very comforted in this little space here, but clearly there are undertones that of not all is well in Zion and there's some dark, sinister events on the horizon. But in this little space right here, as Nephi is preparing for this moment, it's just like him and his home and his comfort zone and with his God. And Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us today. I loved hearing your insights into this and we're so grateful to you for all the great work you're doing there at Scripture Central and the wonderful resources. Um, you're providing to help us study the scriptures more. Thank you. Well, of course, it was really fun to kind of meet you for the first time and to swap notes a little bit on our respective experiences running art contests for the Book of Mormon. And I'm so thrilled with the work that you're doing. And I think the church needs more of this. We need more um, celebration of Book of Mormon art. So I think it's fabulous.